and thought, oh, we're establishing our kids to be Olympians. It wasn't that at all. Like for my family, growing up in Connecticut, it was how can we get our, our young daughters or my brother into something that they're interested in, whatever it might be. Okay, so for growing up in Connecticut, the number one sport for young girls is soccer. It's easy, you can have like um, anyone kind of run it to, because you don't need a lot of space and equipment. And so every school basically had it. So from kindergarten all the way up, I played soccer through high school and I loved it. Not as well as Leo here, who's an all-star soccer player too, right? So we started playing soccer and same thing with my brother and my sister. And then one day when I was in second grade, my brother came home and said, can I play hockey? to my parents. I wasn't a part of this conversation. And he just happened to have a couple friends that played hockey. My parents were like, well, well, let's go to the local rink and figure out what hockey is. <laughs> uh, so they went to the local rink and they signed my brother up for learn to play hockey. And then my sister and I, we got signed up for figure skating. <laughs> and a lot of reasons, right? Because at the time, girls only were really figure skating and Asian girls were really figure skating. That's what there was it was more common at the time, right? Chrissy Yamaguchi was someone we got to watch and I was like, she, I was like, she's amazing. <laughs> um, so that was it. And it's not because my parents were really these stereotypical in the sense that they were like, you have to only do this because you're a girl, because you're Asian. They weren't that, it was just, they didn't know. So when you don't know, it's hard to then create more opportunities. So what was cool is it only took them two months to figure it out <laughs> and be asking quite often. And I asked them, can I play hockey? And they made the best decision of my life at eight years old. And they didn't do it because they thought I would go to the Olympics or I would play on a national team or in university. They did it because their young daughter wanted to try something new. And so they wanted to open a door for them. And so they did so and I had the opportunity to play hockey, and I loved it. And they went to the local rink, and they suited me up in the old stinky oh. hockey equipment. Right? They're like, suit her up, because if she likes it in this, then she's gonna like hockey. <laughs> and for sure, I loved it. My first practice was really just two cones, and this is all I remember, was two cones and just skating in a figure eight. Just over and over again, falling a lot, but just skating and skating. There wasn't even a puck, I don't even think. And I loved it, I came off with this huge smile. My parents knew I loved it at that moment. And and you want a real magazine? I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, they used to have these little fake ones where you just have the template. But I will tell you, yes, that's a new ma that was a real magazine. No, <laughs> uh, but no, that was my first one though. Uh, and then for me though, what was, when we go back to environments, again, I was the only girl playing hockey at the time. And I grew fast. This is me in the middle. This is my teammate and we're the same age. We're, I'm not standing on a step. <laughs> I was really big as a, as a young kid and you know I should have felt probably awkward but I didn't and I also what was cool was that even though I was the only girl in this boys environment the coaches the parents and the players they made me feel welcome and they didn't make me feel welcome as a girl they made me feel welcome as a teammate and that was really important and that set me with the mentality of what I wanted to do moving forward anywhere I went was to make people feel welcome, right? And I think it was, and as I think about it more, like it made me realize as I got older why that was so important to me. It was because at a time where girls weren't playing hockey, or it would have been easier for them to say, no, nah, you probably shouldn't, or you don't belong here, they didn't. And I remember getting to the national team and some of our older players sharing stories about how their teammates would spit on them. They're actual teammates. And I was like, if that ever happened to me at any age, I'd be like, peace out, I'm going to another sport. <laughs> Figure skating sounds perfect, right? Uh, whatever sport. Um, but I was lucky that the environment I grew up in wasn't like that, right? Where I, was I still challenged by people outside? Yeah, but it didn't really bother me because those weren't the people that were in my life. And so this was started my love for hockey, having a great environment, finding ways to be engaged in hockey. But this was the moment where everything kind of changed and my track changed and my mentality changed. So 1998 was the first time women's hockey was an Olympic sport. And yes, on the US side, it's extra special because we ended up winning a gold medal that year. Cami Granado, who for us was like the goddess, right? <laughs> She's now the Poulain. She was our Poulain, right? <laughs> Absolutely amazing. And a huge, awesome, humble role model leader. She was what I watched, again, super baby, no, they're super babies, I'm just this kid, like, <laughs> watching them. But it was the moment that I saw it that I was like, maybe, maybe this is what I can do one day. So I started thinking, 
one day I want to dream of getting there. I don't want to be that person <laughs> in any way, but maybe one day I can make it to the Olympics. And so a seed was planted that day when I actually got to see, right? And that's why when we talk about representation, when we talk about surrounding ourselves and with different people, when we can see and understand what's possible, then we can start to believe maybe it is. So this was back in 1998, the seed was planted, but like everything, and this isn't rocket science, the seed's planted, but although we want it right now, right? All the time, like our patients, especially now with technology, is low, 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 low. At least maybe that's me as a parent, I'm not sure. <laughs> but our patience gets a little bit less. But we have to realize that the day that we plant a seed, the day that we say we want a goal or we work on a new skill, is likely not the day we're gonna get it. It's gonna sometimes be quicker and within a week or two, and it might take a year or two or three or four, right? And the longer term ones are a little bit harder. But what's really consistent in anything that we do, whether it happens quicker or not, is one belief, and then the other part, and this isn't the rocket science, is just being willing to work for it. And I think where I just recently heard uh, like a little kind of clip from one of uh, these coaches, Donnie Granado. He's the head coach of the Buffalo Sabres. Cammy Granado is his sister, and he's awesome. I've known him since I was a little kid. And he basically said to a group, he goes, you know, working hard is the minimum, right? So when you have people say, well, I work hard. He says, well, great. So does she, so does he, so does the other person. <laughs> working hard is the minimum. As much as we say that's a value we have, working hard nowadays, especially when we get to an elite environment, should be the minimum. So that shouldn't be our defining characteristic, but working hard and then finding a way to work harder. Right? And I saw another thing, and again, we're always trying to learn and grow and get different clips here and there. Another one was talking about nothing ever gets like fully easy, right? There's nothing as easy. Because as we get better at something, it gets easier, but then we can interlace something else to make it harder. So we're always challenging ourselves to grow and to get better. And so having this mentality that we have to be willing to work for it is really important, right? So work for everything that we want, and if you don't believe me, then you can believe this little kid. Hold on, maybe for a second. Get up, you work hard for it, we can't work hard for it. When me and my brother, we work hard for our stuff. It don't come easy, and life does the work. Get up, walk into the shop of the pool shop, or the fish of the pool shop. I'm gonna never want to be that shark. Take over everything. Strength, no weakness. Power, muscle. Have to have that mind. So you can come in here and dominate. When you see it, you fall. You don't put yourself down. You want to keep yourself, keep yourself up, up, and ready for any challenge. <laughs> And the funny thing about this, we showed it probably five, six years ago for the first time. And we had a player at, at the time named Sophie Gagnon, who loves this stuff. And I love this stuff. Right? So it's borderline cheesy. She's a teacher now from a middle, a elementary school teacher up in Saguenay, where she's from. And in the middle of the game, at one point, she goes, guys, be the shark! <laughs> I was like, so it works. It totally works, right? And uh, I love her for that, that energy she brings. But it's totally true, right? And so we talk about that working hard. Work hard, find a way to work even harder, right? We see it all the time. You didn't even realize you had this next level to be able to commit and to work harder as well. But then on top of that, we can't just do it when we feel like it. We can't just do it when I've had the perfect amount of sleep, when I've eaten the perfect meal timed in the right way, and I've stretched pro No, I'm not gonna touch my toes. Like all this stuff, right? We have to find a way to be an everydayer, to consistently chase after the things we want and give that full effort every day, right? And I know that we say this all the time, none of this is rocket science, but at the same time, it's, it's not always easy to do, right? That one of our, our mental skills coach for 2014 says, it's not about knowing what to do, it's doing what you know. It's not, no, do it, it's not knowing what to do, is doing what you know. We know a lot of stuff, but we don't always do what we know, or we don't always do what we know we need to, right? So how do we become an everydayer? And for us, the reality is we're humans. So we are gonna have days, even if we love what we do, even if we wanna do it and we wanna work hard, or we're gonna have days where we wake up and we're like, ah, oh, not today, right? But how do we have fewer of these? It's when we love what we do. 
when we really enjoy and are passionate about the things that we do and the people around us, it's easier to have those tougher days become less tough and become really special. Right? I get often asked all the time, well, will your daughters play hockey? Right? You're, I'm a four and a half year old, a two year old, and I go, I don't know if they want to. Because the bottom line is, it can't be what I want, it's what they want. Well, I love if they play hockey, yes, I'll do a little dance. <laughs> <laughs> but if they don't, that's okay too. And I'm gonna help them figure out what they love to do and what they're passionate about, because then they're gonna be happy, they're gonna work hard, they're gonna develop, they're gonna grow, they're gonna do all the things that we want to. So it can't be my dream, it can't be my like wish for someone. And I say that same thing when I speak with recruits that want to come to Concordia or are considering Concordia, I ask them, I don't look at their parents, I say, what do you want out of your experience? Because there's a lot of people that sometimes are one as an experience, but maybe an a parent or a coach or someone else feels like they should have a different experience. So that's really important. Be an everydayer in order to be an everydayer, make sure you're chasing after what you're passionate about not what other people think that you should be passionate about. For me, really, really blessed. As I said, I played 14 years in the national team. And uh, during that time, I, I went to 2002 in Salt Lake, 2006 in Torino, Italy, 2010 in Vancouver, and 2014 in Sochi, Russia. And each one unique and amazing and awesome. But the big difference for the last one was I almost didn't make the team. 2000, the, my first three Olympics, I was a pretty steady on the roster. I was a top three line player playing in every situation. 2014, it changed because my younger players, my younger teammates, they were just better. Reality sets in and it's okay. <laughs> I think sometimes we hear that and it's like, well, oh God damn it. <laughs> but that's not the case. Life sometimes happens where other people improve and we don't. We hit our little bit of that end of the career for the national team level. And so I had a bunch of choices at that point. One, will I still commit fully? Will I work hard? And also be okay if I don't make the team, but be willing to give it everything I have. And during that process, will I then be able to make the team, if that happens, and own a role that I hadn't done previously, which is to not play a lot. So instead of playing 20 minutes a game, going down to three to four to five minutes. Big, big difference. Was I willing to accept that as well? Not only just make the team and say, I'm Olympian, but make the team and accept the role and support my teammates the way I needed to. And I like to say that I was. And it wasn't easy. It's not easy to do that, but it was something that was important to me. Again, what do we bring to this space around us? That's yeah. our choice to do that. And my choice in uh, 2014 was to make sure I put myself in a place to earn a spot on the team and then contribute in whatever way I could. And that was really important. And so. For us, we know the women's hockey rivalry in uh, US and Canada. For those that don't know it, it's funny because we get asked often, it's like, okay, how's women's hockey? Like, there's no checking. Like, is it physical or what is it? And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> 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 like, What's going on here? I'm going to live under a rock. You know? <laughs> but in reality, also, too, like, it, television in general doesn't do justice not only to the women's game, but to hockey. Like, everything is faster and more physical when you're in person. So that's what I always encourage. Is, Go to a hockey game in person, right? Whatever it is, whether it's NHL, it looks even faster. University on the women's side of the national team. Go in person if you get the chance because it's a totally different experience. And so, yes, they have this amazing rivalry. And what's amazing about it is that before 2000, I would say, or 2002, there was actually more of a hatred of each other. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not actually even kidding you because I remember this moment when Cammy, who became a great friend of mine and still is, there was a moment where like, we were walking into the rink and Hockey Canada was already there and they were just warming up beforehand and usually before it's casual, you're juggling a soccer ball. At the time they were doing like a little hacky sack. And I think, not intentionally, but it just kind of went in front of, of myself and Cammy. We were walking together. And I think it just went over there. So, oh no, it went past me like this and it was just like where Leo is. So I was like, all right. Grabbed it, tossed it to them. Didn't think of it, just walked in and Cammy goes, that was so nice of you. And I was like, <laughs> I'm such a good person. <laughs> I, I, I get, and Candy's awesome. If you ever meet her, like, kind as can be, amazing. Like, this is like the scar person of a person. But they, there wasn't enough crossover at that time. And like, women's hockey was still in its infancy, so there weren't enough players from from Canada, the U.S. that had 
got a chance to interact with each other off the ice. It was only on the ice when they're chasing the same goal and same dream. So it's really tough to kind of understand each other better or to build friendships, right? There was hatred. And so when I came around as this kid, that's like, my game face is always like this. <laughs> like I was really grateful that I came around at a time where there started to be a better blend because you had a lot of Canadians coming and playing in the NCAA. And then now with the professional opportunities afterwards, working camps and then also just playing together, now you'll see there's huge friendships and awesome friendships. Obviously, Carolyn and myself were married, so we had this Canada US uh, on that side. But even the same thing, like, you know, Poulain, who I should hate, I like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't love, I just like. It's <laughs> but it is, like, you, you have this appreciation for him because we do. So the intensity of the rivalry is still there. There's still a bitterness, and in, like, for whoever wins, whoever loses, there's those raw emotions that are there. But it's a really cool thing that improves and drives women's hockey forward and drives hockey forward, I think. And so heading into Sochi, like one of the things we talk about all the time is when we chase our dreams, we chase our goals. Sometimes it doesn't end the way we want to. But can we have disappointment versus regret? And Sochi at the end, I was disappointed because we lost. And if anyone didn't know, I'm sorry, I lo I, we lost <laughs> on the US side. But it's very different than regret. Regret to me is when we don't prepare, we don't do everything possible to be ready for a moment, and then in that moment, because you're going against another group that's doing the same thing, sometimes we don't end up winning in the end. But can we do everything we can to be prepared for our moment? And honestly, we can do self-check-ins, and we have to be able to self-assess and say, I did, and then if I didn't, then make a decision, why? And am I ready to change so that I am more prepared the next time? And for me, Soshi, that was the case. Right? We were prepared, we were ready. And in the end, we didn't win, but there was a lot of things I was really proud of. So as we walk through this, 2-0, our bench was buzzing. Obviously, when you're buzzing, you're winning, it's easy to, right? But we were feeling confident. Then in the third period, a shot going wide went off the butt cheek of one of my teammates and into the goal. Now it's 2-1. to one. This is around two and a half minutes. But it was great on the bench because on the bench, our demeanor was, it's okay, stay focused, we got this. And for me, that's the preparation. That's the difference versus if I were on the bench and it was like sheer, oh, what's going on? <laughs> that for me would be now we weren't prepared for this moment. And prepared for the moment for an Olympian at that level is the emotional part too. It's not just the hockey, the team systems, it's handling all of that. And so a minute and a half, we have this moment. <laughs> that still hurts sometimes, right? It stays out. The defenseman comes, picks it up, they transition. Offense is on face-off whistle. We call a timeout, same thing, on the bench, calm. This is the face-off, this is what we want to do, this is it, we believe in ourselves, so you're going to do it, right? Again, it doesn't work out, it's just life, and sometimes life is a new right? <laughs> and this freaking Poulain person. <laughs> What a lot of people don't realize is that the game ends as tied 2-2. So everyone goes into the locker rooms, the Zamboni comes out, and then we come out for the overtime. Well, in the Olympics and everything, they're already preparing for the post-game celebration. One team's already ahead, so they have to, because everything's gotta be really quick. So when we come out, we're standing, we're walking by a row of people that have gold medals on a platter. So we were two and a half minutes from winning a gold medal. <laughs> and we got to walk out. But again, I'm, I'm always the last one that was off the ice because I always like to tap everyone before they got off. So we were around, and as I came up, and, you know, they weren't there, but I said, hey, heads up, eyes up, we've got this. And we go in. And as we round, and it was a bit of a walk to our locker room. And by the time I got there, like, the door I've kind of closed, and it was the last one left before I go in. And I just take a deep breath, and I'm like, okay, let's go. Because I was one of the leaders on the team. and. And at the same time, I wasn't quite sure. Not because anyone gave in indicators, but I wasn't quite sure what I would get when I opened that door, because that's a lot to handle. It's a lot to handle for a two and a half minute stretch, walking by the gold medals and then going into the locker room. And we go in there and everyone put a little bit quieter, but I was really proud that within 30 seconds, one minute max, everyone switched and they went back into prep mode. They went back into what they would typically do be between periods to get ready. 
have their snack, get their, their fuel up, whatever it is, get their minds in the right set so that when the overtime came, they were ready to go. And I was really proud because I thought we pushed really hard at the start of that overtime. We got some opportunities, we had an amazing chance by amazing Amanda Kessel, and then Sabados made an awesome save as well, right? And at the end of the day, yeah, sports sometimes doesn't always feel fair, at least for us <laughs> in this game. And we ended, and I felt like my teammate that's kneeling there, and all of you felt like the person of the Canadians in red there, <laughs> and Leslie and me, and America mixed in here, right? But the reality is, like, I look at this, and yes, there's disappointment, and there's sadness, because we want to get the highest, we want to reach our goal. But at the same time, I look at this, and I, I realize, and you think back, although we didn't get that final end goal, and this is life, and this is gonna be a lot of times, this is gonna happen to us all our entire lives, there's still so many things that we did accomplish, and so many things that we are getting out of this experience, even a tougher experience. And so when I look at this picture here, right, of our teammates that were a part of this, like I'm really proud of this group. And yes, would I have loved to win a gold medal? <laughs> Absolutely, much more fun, less tears. <laughs> or more tears of joy, I still would have cried, I think. Um, but I, I look at this group because although we go through tough times, those times shape who we are, right? So as much as losing in that, that gold medal game and, and before, and for me, not reaching my goal of wanting to win a gold medal, that was it, at the Olympics. I never got to reach that goal, but there's still so many things I experienced that have shaped me into who I am, that I like to think I carry now into the life I lead, into the people that I hope I get to influence in a positive way, and that those experiences help to shape me in that. Right. So when I look at this group, there was a number of those players that went on and found a way that shaped them, that sharpened them, that pushed them and motivated them to go to 2018 and win a gold medal. And I was in my, my room and I was like our, our living room. My daughter was sleeping uh, next to us and I was bawling. Carolyn was kind of crying too. But, <laughs> but I was bawling as well, just because I was so proud and, and so happy for these players, right? And so for all of them, they were shaped by, yes, that winning, but they were shaped by a lot of failure. And failure is a tough word because it's not necessarily failure, but a lot of adversity, a lot of challenges that could either break them or make them stronger. And because of that, you have someone like a Kendall coin right now that's just kicking ass, right? <laughs> She's working for uh, the Blackhawks. She's doing a great job and trying to build women's hockey professionally. She's one of the, the premier players and continues to push the envelope for herself to get better as a premier player as she's taking on all these other roles. You have Megan Duggan here, who is a, has two kids now and has just been named uh, the head director of player development for the New Jersey Devils. Right? So all these things made these women stronger so that now when they go into a room of NHL areas where probably are still dominated by men, and that's not, that's not good or bad or whichever, they have more confidence to go in there because they face diversity, they face challenges, and they have confidence in themselves to handle whatever comes their way. So yes, I'd rather have won. I'm gonna be clear on that. <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, there's a lot we can still take from it. And there's a lot of strength that we can grow from the good, the bad, and everything in between. And so this is uh, another cool thing that we get to do. We share this all the time with our, our student athletes, but as, as athletes, we are more visible, right? We have that opportunity, and I think that honor to be able to share our stories, to be able to share our medals, to share different things with others, to hopefully, one, plant a seed for them to then dream and, and want to pursue things, whether it's hockey or something else. And so I came back, These are. this is actually my niece, this is Maddie, she was three at the time. I have a nephew that's a year and a half and uh, a five-year-old niece as well, her sister. So I go back, it's probably two days after coming back from Sochi, and I was still pretty bummed, right? Like this, I knew when I finished that game that was gonna likely be my last time in a USA jersey. So I cried a lot and I sat there and it was hard to take it off eventually. So I came back, all these emotions, everything. And I give her the medal, she's looking at it, and that smile, and she goes, oh, this is beautiful. <laughs> and I go, I knew I loved you. <laughs> and then you have little Lewis, uh, one and a half, that takes a look, has no clue what this thing is. It's just heavy for this little kid, and he goes, <laughs> <laughs> Kids are gross. I see my, my two-year-old just licks things, right? <laughs> and then you have uh, Sophia, who's like five. So she's now like learning how to, to read and write in kindergarten. She comes back with this, she goes, I'll be right back. And I was like, all right, Sophia. 
and it's uh, my February journal. I love and then they fill in the blank. Right? I was like, all right, cool. I don't really understand in the moment what this is about. And suddenly she goes, I love my mom. I go, all right, so you love my sister. Okay, good, this is good. I love my dad. I was like, picture's getting better, this is good. <laughs> and then the next one is, I love USA. And she points, she goes, that's a girl hockey player. And I was like, that's really cool. And she goes, you know, one day I want to play in the Olympics. And I thought, I'm such a proud on. This is amazing. <laughs> and then she looks at me and says, you think we'll be on the same team? <laughs> I was like, well, I didn't want to like shatter her hopes. I said, maybe. Um, but for me, it was an awesome moment. And I share it because it's not only about her wanting to go to Olympic Games, but it's the idea that she could dream about it. When I was her age, I didn't even dream about it because I didn't think it was possible. And that she actually thought it was just normal that girls played hockey. That it wasn't the unusual. That it was just, yeah, there's girls and the boys and they play hockey. That's it. And I think that's what's cool and that's what's changed. And I do think that's what visibility and representation does. 98 started opening that window. And every Olympic Games, it got more and more. And we even see it in the growth of hockey. In 1990 when it started, I think there was like 18,000 playing. And now in the States. Uh, girls playing and now it's uh, up to 70,000 right and they see every Olympic Games for that two-week period when it's visible for two weeks there's that the what well, the beginning I think it was seven or eight percent growth but now every year there's an additional two three four percent growth right after an Olympics and that's just after two weeks of extra visibility imagine if we just expanded that even more right so it's pretty cool so again blessed beyond all everything to have had the opportunity to play for 14 years. At some point, the body says, you can't play anymore. You have to figure out life after. And coaches also decide you can't play anymore at that level. <laughs> so a little bit of both. So transition is always tough in everything. It could be having a path in one career and figuring out another career. But for athletes, we see it all the time. And, and sometimes my national league athletes did a great job transitioning, and sometimes we struggle. And that's OK. We all struggle at some point. Right? Uh, we're so used to having this high level of success in something that we're passionate about that we maybe got introduced to when we were you know, five, six, seven, eight years old. And then the life was 20, 25 years with that. And now we have to figure out, okay, what are we still passionate about, but it's different. And so it could be a hard time, but for something I was really lucky to do is I got introduced to coaching at a young level. When I was 14, 15 years old, I worked <coughs> summer camps just pushing, literally pushing pucks into piles. I wasn't even getting paid, it didn't matter, but I thought it was the coolest thing. I was a junior counselor. Very <laughs> cool, right? I don't even remember anything I did besides pushing pucks where I was supposed to. And then gradually I got a chance to, to do that more in summer camps during university so that when I graduated from Harvard, I wanted to be a coach. And I got a chance to coach for a little bit. So I had the, the first best job was to be a full-time athlete. Best job. And also I'd say student athlete, that's all kind of combined. And my next best job is what I'm doing right now. I get an opportunity to be a coach at the university level and I absolutely love it. And why I love it, and I love this level, is because we're at a, they're at an age, and our, our student athletes are at an age where we can really challenge them on the hockey side. So developing their skills, they're still pushing and they want to grow, they want to learn, they want to get better. So we're developing their, their skills, their team concepts, all those sides. And we're helping them hopefully interlace a lot of the things that are beyond just hockey skills, but nutrition, sleep, balance, all those things. And then we have the opportunity to help our student athletes grow as people. And that for me is really, really special. And that's why this age group is really special. So I look at these young student athletes and these strong young women, and I see how some of them we only had a year or two because they joined this late, but some of them we've had from for six years three, four, whatever it is, but the impact they've had on us and the impact hopefully we've had on them. And that's why I love this and I'm really fortunate to get a chance to work here at Concordia, to work with Carolyn, to work with Leo and all the other great student athletes that we get to. And so when I took over the team, one of the number one things that we needed to do and wanted to do was really be clear on what is our culture and then really make that the primary focus of what we did every day and with that, that then allowed us to get better as people and to get better as athletes. 
right? Really, really important. And the thing that about culture is sometimes you'll say this was a good day. Everyone was getting along. Everyone was buying in. Everyone was there. We're there. Our culture is awesome. You were, our culture was good that day. But today, we got to do it again. So the consistency that we do it and, that it, and knowing that it's always evolving, right? So talking about environments, what do we say in our environments? What do we allow be, to be said, right? The same thing, right? If someone's complaining and I'm a veteran or not even a veteran, if I'm, could, someone's complaining, do I just listen to them and it's okay, you can complain. And then a younger player or someone else hears it and it's like, well, she says it's okay. So this complaining must be okay. Well, no, or I say, hey, I hear you, but this isn't it, let's change our mentality, right? So same thing, it's always dynamic, we're always adding to it, we're always adding value to it. And so at Concordia, we make it really specific. And this was actually something that, I we kind of shaped it more specific here, but it came from my time at Harvard. When I got there, the players introduced and they said, our culture here is team first. And I know, everyone loves the idea of team first, it sounds like that catchphrase, it's like, oh, that catchphrase, it feels good to say, I'm team first. But it's harder to live it. And so at Harvard, the players came up with this because they hit a patch where they had a lot of talented players. They had some players returning from the Olympics, from national teams, and then you had a mix of players that were part of the university team but weren't at those levels. But they found that those, especially coming at the higher levels, suddenly started focusing more on who was getting points than if our team was winning and being successful. And so they as a group and as players, instead of someone saying, well, that was my point, and stuff like that, they said, hey, we gotta come back and we gotta get on the same page and it can't be about individual stats and it can't be about us as individuals, it has to be about us as a team. So it was really powerful because they decided, they looked and they said, this is not the environment we want. We don't want an environment when it's only about me and me and that person and this person. We want an environment where we're adding to our team and we're building our team up. And so that was how it was introduced to me and I've just brought that with me everywhere I go. And that's a cool thing about sports, right? The people that I got exp to experience, my veteran players that I joined with, showed me what it was like to be team first. Right, it wasn't just Olympians, it was all the different players owning their role, finding ways to contribute to it, contribute to it, and talking about it, and showing the importance of it. And so that made an impact on me, and now I run to Concordia, <laughs> everywhere I go. And so for us, it's three simple things. One, giving our best every day, so going back to working for it and then finding a way to work harder. Doing that consistently, bringing a positive attitude. And this one's cool because people say this all the time, positive attitude. Well, positive attitude doesn't only mean smiling and cheering people on. That's part of it because there's some, some body language, there's certain things that energy we give by doing that. But positive attitude is also going through tougher things or going through bad days and finding a way to see a more positive spin on it than the other. An example is it, I could be in a game, I turn over a puck and they go down and score. Well, I don't have to exactly be happy. Oh, that was awesome. <laughs> no, probably don't feel great about it. But I can take a deep breath and now I have a choice. I can let that mistake be like, I'm terrible, I'm not good at this, I can't do this. Or, even worse, it was Leo's fault. <laughs> or, I can say, well, that was a tough moment. I'm going to be better the next shift. And I'm going to make this adjustment. Right? So that's a positive attitude, is choosing to instead of blame something else or think I'm terrible, to say deep breath, what can I do positively the next year? Okay, so positive attitude, really powerful in all aspects of our life. And it's not just hockey, we can just say, I have so much schoolwork on my plate for our student athletes. I'm, I'm swamped, I've got a million things. All right, how do, or for me, I'll go, <laughs> example I have oftentimes. My kids did not sleep, I was trying to get them a the daycare, I'm 10 minutes late for this video session and I'm like, I have to apologize to our players. Now we have practice and I feel like I am running around. This has happened. So now, how do I take a deep breath and say, okay, reset, practice. What's our first drill? What's the feedback we wanna give? What's that? Right, that's my way of seeing it there as opposed to being like, this is gonna be a tough day, <laughs> right? Life is the way it is, how do we see it? And the last one is accepting and owning our roles. This is so, so important. For us, like everyone has value. But it's hard on a team where there's players that are in the stands because we have, say, 25 players on a team and only 20 dress for a game. And so I oftentimes think that all of us, we do, it, it's, it's normal, it's natural, that sometimes we feel our value is tied to the amount of ice time we get or to the role we have. But we really try to emphasize that the value that we give 
is a role that we're asked to do and do it the best we can because we need every role to be successful, right? Really, really important. And, and this is really cool because one of the, I tell, well, Leo's a great example too. So Leo this year, we had some injuries early on. She's typically a forward. And this year we had to ask her to be a defenseman. There are not many people that can do that at this high level. And Leo was like, yeah, I'm gonna do my best and I'm gonna do it and we're gonna figure it out. And, and she was team first in that her role changed from being a forward to a defenseman. If I asked her to be a goalie, maybe it'd be a little bit <laughs> But it's okay, she had her sister there, right? But that was her choice to be team first there. In the same way, her sister, her first year, like she came in, she came in as one of the top goalies out of Sejum, so our, our junior college year. But when she came in, we had a true number one that was a fifth year goaltender, who had a lot of experience, had gone through a lot. And there is a big transition when you get to university, right? It, it's really tough for most players to transition seamlessly in. And then goaltending, it's even harder because you don't rotate people every other shift, right? So it's, it's different. Well, Alice came in and she worked hard always. She had a great mindset, but she wasn't ready, right? She wasn't strong enough. She wasn't quick enough yet because she was still young. She was still figuring out the university games. The shots were harder, but she stayed patient with herself. She gave her best every practice and she grew and she developed over that full first half. So this is months. Gets into the second half and has gone better. And so she gets into a couple games, but Kat is still our number one. And but Alice has kept this awesome mentality of, that's okay, I'm still gonna work hard, I'm gonna be an awesome teammate, I'm gonna support, I'm gonna push, I'm gonna get better. So then we get to playoffs. The way our playoffs work is that we have a semifinals of our RCQ, our conference, and then we have a final. So whoever wins the semifinals, those two teams will go to our final, conference finals, but they automatically qualify for nationals. Right, so really big. So this is like playing against like what we also want. So we're in our first uh, game. Our number one goalie, Cat, fifth year goaltender wins. We win that game here in Concordia. That's on a Thursday night. Then on Saturday night, we go up to Ottawa. We're playing Ottawa. So it's the best of three games. We lose the second game. Cat's in goal. We get back uh, Saturday night. Sunday morning at 9 a.m. We're supposed to play at 3 p.m. on Sunday. This is now the third game, the final game. Determines who won, wins the series, goes on to the RCQ finals, and then goes on to nationals. And Kat calls me and she goes, hi. I was like, oh, show you. I go, hi, Kat. And she goes, I'm not okay. I go, I, I came down with the flu and I can't move. Like I can't barely walk down like the hallway. She goes, Alice has to play. Because we had a third goaltender, but there was a gap between Alice and our third goaltender. So I said, okay, Kat. I hung up, dialed, hey, Alice, just to let you know Kat's sick, you're in today. She goes, okay, I'm ready. And sure, she was, and it was awesome. And so she goes into this game, and our team plays really well in front of her, but in the last dying seconds, it's like two to one. They're, they pulled the goaltender, we're down, you know, so now six on five for them. There's a little scrum in our defensive corner. Alice is here. We leave the number one leading scorer, the lead right here. Wide open. Wide open. Everyone just staring at this pile. And obviously the puck pops out right to her. And this is now like 10 seconds left in the third period. And Alice pushes and makes a huge save with her left pad. We end up winning two to one. Huge save. I'm telling you, like it was a moment where I the push, you're like, why is that person, why? <laughs> Game, she still does a great job, and then Kat gets healthy, and she's able to come and, and also replay, um, and ends up playing for us. But the great part is that she stayed ready in this moment. She accepted her role. Is it easy to do? No. Of course Alice wanted to play, right? Everyone does. But at the time, she was patient. She worked hard. She was a great teammate. And then when her opportunity came, she was ready. And that's the mindset, and that was her choice for that positive attitude. If she chose to see it differently, like, I'm never gonna get a chance. This doesn't matter. I can work hard, but it doesn't, like, whatever. Like, it's, it can't, it doesn't, I don't control anything. Then when Kat got sick and she had to go, she wouldn't have been as good as she was, for sure. So yes, sometimes things don't happen and they don't work out right away, but if that opportunity comes, are you gonna be ready for it? And Alice showed that that was the case, and I have so many stories like that. That's why I love coaching this level. Because my life and what I've experienced the last seven years are built around those stories that I get to tell and how I feel. 
And so for us, we spend a lot of time on this. But the reality is, as much as we, we put this, and I, I introduced it here in this room, everyone's like, yes, you're nodding, you feel good about it, and I go, that's good. Live it, <laughs> right? It's not only knowing what to do. This is what's important. We know what to do in a lot of situations. It's doing what we know. So it's not only knowing what to do. This is what our mental skills coach told us, Colleen Hacker, Dr. Colleen Hacker. She was awesome, but she said that all the time, right? It's easy, to, like knowing what to do is just part of it, but then you actually have to do what you know. And so everyone knew what we wanted to do, but to live it is harder, especially if you're living it in a tougher role or that you're asked to work hard every day or be positive and not complain as much and do all these things, right? So our first couple years, as much as people wanted to, it was really hard for us to do it because they weren't really ready to live it. But then as we recruited players, we share this with every player that comes into our program and staff member because we want them to know what our culture is so they know when they get here that one, they're gonna be loved and supported. That's the only thing we guarantee them. But then otherwise, this is our culture and you earn everything you get and this is how we work hard. And so over time, that became who we are and then it became us as coaches not having to say it as much and then them as players being able to say it and to be the voice and to live it and to share it, right? And I think that's what's really impactful. And that led us to this season, which we're really, really pumped about that ended in a pretty awesome way if I can then get this to work. We finished training this time. that uh, put that video together, so it was pretty cool. Um, and what's really fun is obviously, like, uh, like when we look at this, there was a lot that went into it. It's easy to look at this final product and be like, it was an easy, it was a smooth and no problem season. And I was like, this was an exhausting season. <laughs> but it was exhausting in, in the ways that I love, but we had to put in a ton of time and effort to build our culture back. Because as we said, it's a dynamic thing, we have to do it every day. But we worked together for a year and a half. We stayed in touch through Zoom, we stayed in touch through some text, but unless you're going through 
difficult things together, your culture isn't being challenged to actually grow, right? Skill sessions isn't it. You're there, you're working hard, but there's no, there's no extra emotion about playing or not, or losing or winning games and all these different things. So we had to spend some time, and I think we got, by the end of the year, we got to a good place in our team first. I don't even think we're back to a great place, right? It takes time. Like, I'm just being honest, and I think that's what we're continuing to work on. And next season, we're going to continue to work on to make sure at the end of the year, we're going to be in a great place. Because that's what we want. Because when we are in a great place with our culture, we're going to not only be successful like this, right? But we're going to really love the process. And we're going to feel valued. We're going to feel like we grew in a lot of different ways. And what's really cool about this is we had some unbelievable crowds <laughs> by the end of our, our, our uh, season. And whether it was the, the championships, the first round, or this one, but our crowds were unreal. And that's something we've worked really hard to do. We've worked hard and we tell our players to go, invite people to come, right? Give, you have, we have a couple comp tickets and just go, buy them two tickets. Come, invite them to come. Because they come once, there's a good chance they'll come again. And it's the same thing, my, my daughters go to a CP that's part of a daycare that's part of uh, Concordia. So they're all kind of Concordia employees or staff or uh, students that have the chance to put kids in there. So there's a couple of parents who are like, hey, come. So one of them's like, she has no clue of sports. <laughs> she's, she's a super smart genetics biologist over there. And she tells me about what she does. And I'm like, okay, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying, I just, I understand. I'm gonna have to Google some of this stuff. <laughs> but, uh, and she came with a couple of her, her colleagues. And she absolutely loved it. And we talked about it and she goes, I'm coming back again and we're bringing them in. And that's what it's about. So how do we do it? And, and what, what if it's not only about us, but we say to our players that we want to continue growing women's hockey. We want a professional hockey league. So how do we get it? Well, we get it by supporting it, by making sure if the national teams are on TSN or, or there's PHF or there's PWHPA, that you go and you watch it and you support it, right? And same thing for us, you make sure you go and support your other athletes. If you want your student athletes, your other Concordia athletes, male or female, to come, well, go show that you support them in the same way, right? So we have to be the biggest fans of our sport to get that to grow, and we have to be able to be proactive in it. Um, so it's pretty fun to see. And again, a national championship. It's the first time we won a national championship in 23 years, I believe, right? Math major. Awesome. <laughs> I didn't have to do the math, someone told me. <laughs> right, 23 years. Planting a seed. It's not like the other teams didn't want to win it. But it takes some time, and sometimes it doesn't always work out, but it's awesome when it does. Um, so again, plant the seed, be patient, and then the day will come at some point, and if it doesn't, there's a lot of really cool and awesome stuff that happened along the way. Um, a couple of stories I want to tell about these four in particular, but um, these are our six-year players. So one thing about um, us is we get an opportunity to play up to five years here. But the fifth year of them was the COVID year. So there was, school got canceled. And for most of them, because they went to Sage up, these four, they were actually finished in four years because they kind of extended a little bit, did a couple of minors. So for their fifth year, they figured out how to either add a minor, start a, another program, do something different to be able to play a fifth year, right? Because they're undergrad in one category, their main program was complete. So how do they add more classes to fulfill, get a chance to play? Well, it gets canceled, right? And this, for some of them, it was truly their last year that they were gonna play. So you kind of, anytime you have that last bit, same thing with like the Olympics, you do, you kind of put this extra, in, it's, you don't, you, it's kind of like you, you have to, you actually put extra into it. You don't realize it, but you do. When you're younger, you feel like you have all the time in the world. Like your first year on the national team, first year at university, like I have so much time. You're still putting it all, but you don't get the intensity. So when you're in your last year, that summer before, you empty absolutely everything, right? You make those extra, extra, extra. When we have to balance life, then you just find that little extra, but we can't necessarily sustain that all the time, right? And so that's what they did, and then their last season gets canceled. So now they have to figure out, okay, do I wanna come back and now figure out what I wanna do academically? Now do I come back and none, none of them have scholarships anymore because I've given them away because they weren't supposed to be there. So now financially, all of them who really take care of themselves financially have to figure out now financially how do I do it? And then on top of that, do I wanna come back for a six year or go into my next career? And do I have it in me to be as driven as I can? 
And it was awesome to see that they were able to. We had another athlete in this group that moved on. She's at a master's in physical therapy in, uh, at McGill right now, and would have loved to be here. Just for her, the academic side made sense to go to master's. She kind of delayed that fifth year going to do a master's to play. So she moved on, but they made that decision. Um, and so I saw it in the fall, the amount of weight that they brought into the season, because I think they saw what it was not to have a season, and then this fall, and we all did, we all brought it, but they especially had it because this was their last, true last go at it. And I think they had a little bit of fear the whole entire fall that at any moment they won't have a season again. And so that was, we had to work with them and work through that with them because you get it. Because we don't know. When the government decides to shut us down after Christmas for a month and a half, I saw it in their eyes and I was like, as a coach, I was like, how do I help them if we don't start again? Like I was really like hoping, please don't get us in that spot. And so what I had to do as a coach is I said, what are we allowed to do right now? And what is our university allowing? And at the time they allowed us to do little bubble training, not a full team. So you can have whoever lives together kind of little bubbles. So we did that. And we created as many sessions of the day that we needed to, to get it all together and everyone in. And it worked out to like, you know, five or six 50 minute sessions. And so we talked to the coach and said, okay, this is our goal. This is our job because we had, no sense if the season would start, but we're asking them to still train and to play, and we're trying to give them something. And we said, those 50 minutes, can we make it the best 50 minutes of their day? Or can we make it a happy part of their day? Can we bring them joy for 50 minutes? It doesn't even matter if they're bad at what we're doing, <laughs> right? Just get them going and bring them joy in this uncertain time. And they all did, and they worked, not just them, but the team, they did it, and they did great. So then when we got back together, Right? We had three regular season games left, it's fast, to get in shape for then playoffs and then nationals. And we were able to do it. And nationals is three games in three days. So fitness wise, you have to be in a really good spot. So I was really proud and I saw this heaviness of them, but they were also a group that really helped us transform our culture. Right? When they came in, we qualified for nationals for the first time. The next year we were able to win a bronze and then an RCQ championship. And then now for them to finish not only winning an RCQ, but a national championship, it's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and the last story I'll share is Mandy here on the upper right. She's funny, she's like, she's our little spitfire. She's the one that you have, you, she'll have these like straight, honest little answers and you're kind of like, you need a little sugar in your answers. <laughs> a little sugar. For us it's fine, but I can see how many with your teammates, you gotta have a little sugar. But she came into us very, very much black and white and needing to have the comfort of knowing where she was going, right? Like uncertainty, like wasn't good for her. And it was cool to see her evolve in that. And she had no choice because she came in thinking that she wanted to be in math. First semester, realized I don't want to be in math, <laughs> right? And she actually failed her first class ever. She's a really good student athlete. First class ever, was living away from her family in Quebec who she was really close with, living on her own and learning how to cook for the first time, away from her boyfriend, in English for the first time, so extremely exhausted, and then failed the first class. So in December we meet and she goes, I don't know if this is for me, and I think I might leave. And I'm gonna go pursue maybe this over here, but she didn't know. And I said, okay, Maddie, absolutely. I know it's tough not to know, but don't just leave before you don't even know if that's what you want, okay? I said, give it a shot, let's figure out and let's talk. What do you wanna do? And then we'll figure out and talk to people at the university that might be able to fit what you do. And so she did and she found athletic therapy and she did really well on it and she did a great job and she stuck with it. And I saw her evolve during that time to be okay with uncertainty to some extent. She's still gonna be like that. And she still has those like, she still needs a little more sugar. <laughs> but she's awesomely great. And she was able to develop into that person. And um, again, we have a really good and honest relationship like all of our players, we try to. They know we love to support them, but we can't only have good, easy conversations with her. So in the fifth year, all of them, Bridge, Bells, like, as well as Steph had said they're coming back, and Medi decided she wouldn't come back. So she, we had a Zoom call, because we were in person, and in March she goes, I'd like to come back next year. And what we have to realize is those four were supposed to graduate, and we already had a full class coming in. But it made sense, this was a really talented class to keep all these players. So we had a gigantic roster of 29. And some of the forwards coming in were really talented. They were top three, top five in scoring in the junior league. So I said to her, 
committee will welcome you back because you're great, you can add value, but you have to realize that your role might be different. She was used to playing in the top two lines, power play, penalty kill, last minute of the game situations. And I didn't know if that's what she would be in because we were having some really talented players. At the same time, we didn't know how quickly they would adjust or not. And so if we had that conversation. I said, Nadi, like, so will you be okay coming back and being in and out of the lineup? And she goes, I don't know. Honest Nadi. I go, okay. <laughs> and I go, but she paused and she goes, but I'm gonna do everything possible to make sure I'm not in that situation. And to, <laughs> and to her credit, she did. She worked really hard and, and there were some times where she had to battle some medical stuff like figuring it out, but she worked really hard and she got herself in tremendous shape and she came into practices and she played with an intensity and a bite to her game and habits and being diligent to it. And we had to talk to her a little bit also about, hey, you gotta find a little balance in the intensity too. Because sometimes she'd get mad at something like snap it and go, <laughs> a little bit of this. And so she had this incredible job and she had one of the best seasons of her career. And she ended up being an all-star for us, a, a second team all-star of the RCQ, and she wasn't even in the conversations in her previous four years. So it's pretty cool that that for her was an opportunity to make a choice. Does she choose based on a tough conversation where I didn't give her a lot of sugar either to say, well, F you, you guys are against me and it doesn't matter what I'm gonna do, or I'm gonna do everything in my control to work hard, to put my best foot forward, to make sure that I'm, I'm battling for it. And she did that option. And in doing so, she had an amazing season and she did a great job. And at the end of the year, we won and I'm on the ice and like, we're chatting I go, so Manny, you remember when I talked to you about not playing much <laughs> this year? And now she was in a top two line, she played a power play come later, all this stuff. She, I go, how does it feel to prove me wrong? She goes, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I, I love it. And now uh, next year she's going to be coaching a youth team back where she's from. So all these good things come full circle. Um, so the last two slides, uh, I know that I talk a lot is, um, again, I'm really passionate about these things is we talk about what are our goals for our players when they leave here? Yes, we want to win. We want to win national championships, conference championships. We want to be great hockey players. But these things here, we want them to leave with even more so than that. Hopefully both are interlaced. <laughs> But we want them to take pride in being committed student athletes because that's what their roles are now so that afterwards they can be, take pride in being and having the balance of whatever they take a hold of whether they end up becoming parents and working full-time whatever they're coaching and working and all these things we want them to have pride in that because that's what their ro role is now be great citizens of our communities right how can we give back to those around us for all the great things that we've gotten so we take time to go and visit schools. We take time to spend time with charities and different organizations as much as we can because it's really important, right? These people have given us, so we need to give back to others too. And we need to treat people around us with a lot of care uh, in the same way that others are treating us. Um, continual growth and development. We're always trying to get better. Us as coaches, I say this all the time that if I'm the same coach now as I am in five years, I'm not gonna be a good coach in five years. I'm not going to because everything involves. And if I'm not getting better this year into next and to the next, before then I know it, I'm gonna be way behind in five years from the coach I need to be, right? So we're always getting better in all facets. Embracing team first. Yes, it's hockey, but it's also gonna be in our, our work lives afterwards and our family life and our friend life. That's everything, right? How can we be a part of that and live it? And this last one is what I will actually introduce this to our players. And this came from one of our conversations I had with one of our, our players just recently. But I want our players to leave and go into their next phase of life knowing the value they bring into that space. I want everyone to know their value and know who they are and how they can positively and awesomely um, impact the places that they are. And so in knowing their value, they're gonna be the power that they have to be able to make a difference. And I, that for me, this is confidence, this is everything, but it's who they are, honoring who they are so that they know that they can go in. Because I think a lot of times, especially here, the coach is making a decision ultimately on a roster. We feel that there's so many things out of our control, but I want everyone to know, okay, yes, there are, but what are the things in my control? What are the things I can take hold of and be great at? Um, and that's powerful. Um, and then the, the last part is uh, we all have a place. You know, I think one thing that we talk a lot about here is that we want to play, 
create an environment that is inclusive. And we want to create an environment where representation and people can see and, and, and feel confident in who they are, wherever they are, right? So when Carolyn and I decided to, to share our relationship with the world, we did it over Twitter, which probably is not the best way, but, <laughs> but our families and our friends and, and our teams, they all knew for a long time. We have been dating since 2005. Um, and then, but we didn't want to be in the media and the public with our relationship because our conversation when we went to play against each other, Canada and the US, we didn't want it to be about our relationship. We wanted it to be about hockey. So we kept that to our private life, but everyone knew that was close to us. Um, but then once we had Liv, our youngest, and we shared it on, on social media, and when you share things on social media, you've got to be ready for everything, right? <laughs> After Sochi, I had to get off social media for a while because we got torn apart like daggers, right? But we put our daughters and our family, we were proud of it, so we said, we don't want our daughters to, to grow up thinking that it's weird or not acceptable to have two moms. In the same way if family has you know, one parent or is raised by grandparents or um, you know, a mom and a dad, it doesn't matter, there has to be acceptance of it all. So it was amazing to see the outpouring of support, but what was also important was the number of parents that we had that had young kids that were playing, or maybe young daughters, it was more so on the, the daughter side, that reached out to us and said, this really helped my daughters. This helped my daughters feel more accepted, and it helped my daughters like figure out a little bit more and, and feel like it was okay, right? And that for us is really powerful. And whatever it might be, we want people to feel included in environments, and sometimes just in the, seeing someone in 1998, women's hockey for the first time, we need to be able to see sometimes that it's okay, that this is normal, natural. And, and Carolyn now shares this at schools when she goes. She goes, she always has a part where she goes, and this is my family, this is my wife, and these are our two daughters. And she doesn't do it to be like, we're gay, and that's like, <laughs> <laughs> like, and like are you okay, you got it? <laughs> and it's not that, it's just to talk about it in a normal way. That's, we're wives, these are our kids, and this is our life. And that's it, so that maybe there's someone there that's like, oh, I've never seen that before, but okay, cool. Especially kids, like they don't care. Right? We kind of get in the way. Let's be honest. Um, but yeah, so that's just like a bit of my story and the things that are important to me. But ultimately, I think sports is this incredible avenue to yes, chase, to put a puck in the net, <laughs> hopefully, or keep it out of the net for out the goaltenders. <laughs> but ultimately, it's an incredible av avenue to grow, to develop, to influence people around us, and and I think make a lot of people and a lot of environments special. That's what I've gotten to do, and that's why I'm in hockey, and that's why I like to, to be a part of it for a long time. That's it. Do you guys have any questions at all? Yeah. So I love your hat, by the way. <laughs> More than anyone else's hat. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, what I really like about sports well, I only played one year of college hockey at MIT, so across right, the yeah. year, and probably around the same time, I think I played in 1999, but um, sports is really great because I think a lot of issues are really transparent and concrete, like, you know, like, what is your role on the team? Is it first line or defenseman or penalty kill? Or, you know, it's very clear what it is, and if you have a issue there's usually um you know some clear answer how to solve it like oh you need to improve your fitness or your nutrition or you know your sports psychology or something um but you know most of us here we're not you know involved in the sports world it's just our hobby so like how do we find like our team like you know we don't necessarily have this wonderful concrete college structure where there's like staff that are just yeah. there to support you and professors who yeah. you know, answer all your questions so you know how do we apply this to like, regular adult lives yeah. <laughs> i know very hard question I'm no sorry. but i i also think that our our work say like our if you don't work in hockey or sports your work environments are a team right you have a boss that's a, a coach that's the coach, and then you have, that has more authority to some extent, and then you have, you know, different levels. You have the captains, the next level, and then you have those that are, you know, the general workers or players. So we already have it, it's all the structure, and I totally use that analogy there. 
So it's really, depending on where you are, is if you are in the leadership position in wherever you are, can you be that leader that thinks about these elements and the importance of those elements? Right, so for us, like we're always introducing new players and then there's players leaving. So it's the same thing in a work environment. You have new people that are joining you at your company or environment and some that are leaving and some that have been there for a long time. So how do we lead and give value to everyone? And so my dad, it's funny, like, so he's not slowing down and he says, <laughs> into his 70s. And I thought he was gonna retire and suddenly he shifted, he got, someone reached out to him, so he just started a new job at uh, kind of a high-paced kind of like, not a, a startup, but like a high-paced job. And so he's always been kind of a chief operating officer and used to that. Um, and then same thing, he's also starting a franchise for mental health. So I was like, ah, okay. But I shared with him a book that I shared with them, it's called The Energy Bus, it's by John Gordon. It's a simple read, I really like it. Uh, and because his previous job, he actually was struggling a bit connecting with, he was a manager of some younger people and he was struggling in it. And I think it's a combination of both. It was sometimes the younger people, but it was also my dad's management style that needed to evolve and change for the company he was at. Before he had always worked at like startups that were really like, we gotta get this done. We gotta be hard, we gotta go. And then he was working at a Microsoft that the dynamic and the culture is different. It's still successful, obviously but the approach had to be different and he didn't quite know how to adjust that approach. And so I shared the energy bus with him with this idea that we have to be able to create an environment where we see the value in everyone, that they're, but then also that it's kind of collaborative within that, right? And I think that there's a way to be able to do it. So yes, it's not easy, but I think I see what we're doing with our team, honestly being able to apply to a lot of like work environments, but it's tough when we're not the ones that are controlling that environment. Does that make sense? So sometimes we can, and sometimes we can't. Sometimes it's the boss, you're like, this is this person is like against all the team first stuff, right? And doesn't create the cohesion. So it's like with the people you work with, how do you create the cohesion and the value and lean on each other? Like I think that's the hard part. And then if you do kind of play in a, a team, in a fun team, it's finding ways to, to, to share with each other or the joy they bring to you. And ultimately, like I think as I get, Last year helped me to figure out with COVID and the potential for COVID and everything that like now it's honestly, how can we bring some joy to each other's lives is basically it. And so does team first allow us to do that? So it's not as easy, I think out of the work with the, I think it's easier as a coach because everyone wants, they want to play. They want to be a part of this. And as you said, all the resources are so compact there. They're not going off to their lives afterwards where they scatter. Everyone sees each other six days a week and it's a lot easier. But in the work environments or the, your family environments, is there a way to create that so everyone's has a more common ground? It's a, the hard, it depends on the company and what's established here. Anything else at all? Yeah. Just how do you deal as a coach with that toxic, pretty best producer? Like I've seen this, I'm not luckily in my organization right now, but I see it all the time more senior person who is the top producer and without that person like you're last or you're not first anymore but with them in place they're taking up so much space that you're not you know that you're not allowing the young the, the Madalev, to come in and you know work and, and be able to take that space they need to grow so that when that guy finally gets hit by a bus or someone puts a bullet in his head, those guys will still can, you know, move into that Whoa. space. Yeah. Um, well, yes, well, we actually not have a look, but they graduate here. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it is, yeah. I think it's the biggest challenge, but I, I do think there's a lot of different facets to it too, right? Like, for us, we believe in team first, but not everyone's gonna be great at it all the time. And there's gonna be aspects where people struggle and now our job as a coach is to figure out why are they struggling with it? Like what is it, how do we help that person get better at it? Ideally they get it and it falls into line and it's the case. And it's no different in the sense that for us, we, we believe in providing the same resources to all our student athletes, whether they play a lot or they don't. But they are gonna be different and our approaches are gonna be different based on what year they are. Because if, what I'm working with uh, with Leo, who's now been with us for three years and has gotten the teaching and understands a lot of it is different than the way I'm gonna approach a first year player that hasn't had the same lessons taught, hasn't had the same consistency of what we've said over the last three years. So you do have to approach it differently, even though 
the time and effort we're putting into those people have to be the same, right? So I think that's the case. But it's actually no different than when we we're talking about our six years. Our six years came in and they gobbled up a lot of the ice time. They stayed, they stayed for that extra year where maybe there would have been some younger players that, that had that opportunity. And now it's our job as coaches and it's the job of players to recognize, one, the value of those older players with their experience, their talents, to contribute to our success, but then their ability to then, how do we learn from them? And then the same way, our older players, how do I help teach? And how do I help guide the younger players so that when I'm gone, they're gonna be able to filter in. But the reality is, in, in hockey, there's gonna be limited space, right? Like there's, there is limited space, so you might have some younger players where you have to get some opportunity, but ultimately we still get back to the point where it's also our job at this elite level that whoever executes the best is gonna play more. So as much as I might want a younger player to get an opportunity to go into the power play, if they're not executing at that level, we're not gonna give them that opportunity. Maybe in practices we can build opportunities for everyone to work on those skills, but not necessarily in a game. That's just a little bit of life, and sometimes people are just not meant to be on the power play. <laughs> but I think we're in the challenges, and this is it. And, and I'll just be honest, like the challenge is, is when you have a young, like a player that is working through stuff and you know is working through stuff that might not be fully, like being a good teammate right now. So how does us as coaches though, and our job is now we're thinking of our time frame. We have young student athletes that are still developing and growing, and we still have to have patience to help them. And so I go back to how can we help them? But it's hard and you have to have a lot of conversations. You have to be direct. You have to have other conversations with their teammates that are a little bit pissed about it because they're like, we're doing everything and this is, it's, just, it's not that we're ignoring it. It's just that we are taking it a deep breath and we're trying to work on it. We're just not ready to just cut this person's head off through the wall, right? <laughs> we're not ready to chop this person away without giving them the opportunity to grow. Because sometimes we need to struggle lose, do whatever, to then get better at where we want to be, right? So it's going to happen, It's but it's more to manage when that person is negative, but a high performer. But then you have to figure out how do I turn that person's mentality around as quick as possible. Because it will, eventually with time, it will hurt the culture, and then you're going to figure out, do you move on from that person, and just, it's going to be better off, regardless if they score 10 goals, but hopefully they're able to figure it out sooner. I've taken up too much time, and you guys have the next, what's your next thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. Love it. I'll take one or two more questions, or I don't know, whatever, because you guys probably have. Yeah. yeah uh, how would you compare the university level in, Ke in, in Quebec, in Canada? Uh, because you, 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 fix, you face some teams from the Transitor Island, so to the US, um, yeah. do you think that we can have more like Nile Didahou or uh, Anso Bete? that you know, they are the national team and they yeah, are yeah. from uh, Harvard, uh, Boston, or you know, the big yeah. names. Uh, how would you compare it comparable to uh, NCAA Division One, Two? Yeah, right so now? definitely Division One. And I think okay. if we took our last last year's team, I think we would have beaten a lot of the teams in the NCAA. Okay. I think we would have for sure been a top 10 team in the NCAA so last year, year, if not even more so. Yeah, so you develop players in the country where they are from? So yeah, yeah, and I think the challenges of keeping players here, right, is um, there's there's two challenges. One, if you just go monetary, like money-wise, yeah, yeah. full scholarships in the States cover everything. Yeah. yeah it's room and board as well. Mm -hmm. Here we can cover full scholarships, tuition and fees, but we can't cover room and board. Right, so you're asking players to stay to pay, even it's it's fairly like, it's relatively like cost effective. Say it's an extra eight to 10,000, right? Like I'm, I'm from the States, so things were like, <laughs> no scholarships to 75,000, right? It's crazy. But say they're, they're eight to 10,000. So scholarship wise, we're not able to give more. So that's a challenge. Then we're still battling the, the notion that the NCAA is better, and that's the dream we should have, because I'd say probably seven, eight, nine years ago, they were much better, right? But I do think that's changing. And I think one, the reason it's changing is because the pool of girls players that are coming out and graduating is much stronger than when I was coming out of college, um, mm -hmm. high school into college, yeah. right? Because of all these Olympics, that now all these players are starting at a young age and having resources to develop younger, so they're much better now than I was when I was coming out the same age. 
And so I think our pool of hockey is better, so we're really strong and our caliber is great. Like, if we go down and play the States, like, we've, we've played some really top teams and done a great job and competed and won, and we've lost some tight games. And so you tried yeah, yeah, so we, we do really well. Like, one year we beat at Clarkson University and they won the national championship that year, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so we'll play some really top teams there. Where it's going to be harder too, like as far as comparable, like resource-wise, we provide a lot of the same things. We don't have as many full-time staff members, right? We were able to add Carolyn as in a full-time assistant, which is awesome, but most programs have two full-time assistants. So it would be amazing to have another, although I'm not going to get greedy since most don't even have one assistant, um, just to keep, there's so much volume of stuff we do, like from meetings with all the players, to breaking down video, to scouting and recruiting and planning trips and touching base with donors and getting sponsors and all this stuff, right? There's, but, so it's fine. But the other thing is, as far as like the cost of education in the States, like those schools that have huge football programs or basketball programs, they make a lot of money. So when you compare our program, to be honest, to University of Wisconsin or Minnesota, those two programs have their own women's hockey rink. Like a whole rink and facility that's at like super nice too, not just like this little rink. So it's a little, like there is a comparison to that. Like, but if you're taking that to kind of some of the, the, the ones in New England, there are some rinks that are very comparable and similar to like what the Stingers have, but there are some that you can't, it's not the same. <laughs> like Google Wisconsin's like women's locker room or their rink, it's, it's nice. There's some, there's some impressive facilities. But I think what's cool about our, our student athletes here is one, we're always trying to build. Like we're doing our best to always continue giving more and more resources to our players to get better. So we're creative with our budget and what we have. We save where we can, we push where we can. We're going to try to find sponsors. We're going to get like, don't, like all these things because that's our job too. And that's the harder part of my job is I, I would never had to do it. So now the asking is harder. That's, I'm developing, I'm trying to get better at that. But like we do it so that they have more and that's really great. But our players, they still have a lot to them, but it's great because they're, our players are blue collar. They know how to work hard. Like Leo knows how to work hard. She works a ton. This, uh, this week, I think she worked probably 80 hours this week. <laughs> she worked Carolyn's first five and then today and all this stuff. And they know how to work and they're appreciative of what they have. And that's why I do love the players that are part of our program because it's, they're not entitled. They're, they don't feel like they should be given everything, but they know how to work. They know the value of work and they understand as well. Like, we also make sure they, they know that too, <laughs> in case they forget. All right, well, great. Thank, Thank you all. You. I hope you guys tomorrow. So if there's